Thanks, Rick. Um, I thought I knew a lot of people when I, after 25 years of retiring uh, from Lob Laws, and then I met Rick Iada. And boy, does he make me look like I'm an insignificant guy in the food business. But it's a pleasure. Thanks, Rick. And secondly, I, uh, during my 25-odd my years at Lob Laws, I used to travel to Alberta a lot. I was very involved with the meat industry. I was responsible for launching uh, Loblaw's Thick and Juicy Burger Program that came from the city. And I was taught to say, howdy. <laughs> and I didn't pick up the phone and, and, and call the Centennial Meat Packers in those days without first saying, howdy. It doesn't sound the same coming from a South African, does it? <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to give you, uh, let's just get the uh, slides going. Um, where do I press this? Oh, I'm missing a, 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 a cover slide. Oh, there it is. From, field, from, uh, from fork to field. And I'm going to give you a retailer's perspective of things. Going to cover a lot of actual stuff that's already been, uh, been discussed, uh, and I'm certain will be discussed. But the, but the importance of what I'm about to tell you is this is how someone like Loblaws or the retailers, can you hear me, uh, are, are thinking about things. And they clearly are thinking very deeply about how they move forward. Because it was, as it was touched on earlier, and I was, for 40 years, I was in retail. Uh, yes, I, was, uh, I came from South Africa. I was working for Woolworth South Africa, a very, very, it, in fact, it came up on one of the slides earlier. Uh, a very dynamic organization that's very closely connected to Marks and Spencers in the UK. Um, and, and many people might regard Marks and Spencers as the most innovative food uh, 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 retail in the world. But I'm not going to go into too much detail. But so I've, I've, I've seen a little bit of the world. <coughs> and as a result, I have a perspective that it's not from field to fork. It's actually from fork to field. The market, driven by the retailers, driven by consumers, driven by different pressure groups, are actually forcing increasingly down the, 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 the food supply chain as to what has to happen and how they want, how, how they want to manage things. So that is, uh, that is given you a sort of a bit of a background of where I get the title. So from fork to field, and, and, and really clearly, when you start to look at, at, uh, at, at what happens within, within a, be a business, like a retailer, but manufacturers, anybody up towards the market end, clearly is thinking, and, and maybe even arguably there's a very good argument that even, even the farmers who are business people themselves are all thinking about this increasingly uh, today. But you have really two major factors when you're thinking about the future. It's the business, business imperative, which is the growing physical regulatory reputational risks that you're managing. You know, it's the environment of a very, very competitive market, and we'll talk a little bit about that here, because boy, we have it in spades in Canada. And dear old Target learned a very bitter lesson, thinking they could waltz into this, this market, and that in fact they were going to be embraced with open arms, even though they had a brand that was really quite well accept, uh, accepted before they came. And the other, is, the other thing is, con is consumer demands. They, they are, they, never before in the 40 years that I was involved with retailers are the consumers setting the pace for, in fact, where, sorry, whoops, I must just get my slides going, of where, in fact, we're going. And, and uh, I guess there's something down here I can watch. So uh, with, with that, it really is giving retailers a, a, a much longer uh, a viewpoint. And I was very lucky working for Loblaws because Loblaws really effectively is owned by the Western family. And as a result, even though they are obviously a publicly traded company, they don't feel the same pressures of what is going to happen on, a, on an immediate quarterly point of view. Young Galen, as I refer to him because I worked for his dad, um, or his G1 versus G2 in the business, um, and, and, and uh, it says that, in fact, he doesn't look at you know, what is even the, the quarter or even the year. But, in fact, because his father was chairman for 30-odd for, 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 for years or 35 years, he feels he's in the same position, that he's making decisions that are for decades, not necessarily for quarters, which is, which is a great place to be. But the, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a very brief history lesson because I want to really look back a little bit and then, and then move forward. And 25 years ago, or a little bit over 25 years ago is when I arrived, uh, just a bit like my slide, retail was actually a very dull and boring place to be. 
uh, it, there were, you know, we had conventional stores, we had the emerging discounts, we had our no frills banners starting. Interesting, only no frills in those days. We didn't have Price Chopper and, and all the others and Fresh Co. Um, and we had, interestingly, in this part of the world, the emerging uh, superstores because you had the ability, you were land rich, you had, didn't have consumers who had to trek across towns. But we didn't have Walmarts, we didn't have Costco's, and we had very little ethnic influence. Also, in those days, the driving forces, there was strong union influence in, the, in, in, in what was happening at the retail point of view. The national brands dictated where the promotional monies, or CPGs, the grocery aisle, and we've already heard about this, the grocery aisle dominated in those days. Um, relationships were purely just one up and one down, and that has changed um, uh, incredibly. For some of you who are probably on the quality assurance food safety side of things, it was really just quality, uh, qu quality control. And I used to joke at Loblaws with my friends in QA just saying, you're the quag quagmire of ambiguity. And you had, you had really people, in terms of innovation, it was really just expanding the, 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 the stable. I mean, it was just, you know, how can we add more products to the continued brand and lineup? But there was, at that stage already, the emerging control brands. And we're gonna talk a little bit about them because they have had a huge effect. And as was mentioned by Rick, I was brought by Dave Nickel to Loblaws at the time to set up what was the emerging product development group and things were changing very rapidly then, although I must say, not as fast as we're seeing. So we had, at those days, and I'm not going to spend too much time, but really, when I headed up product development, I really had three key areas that are focused. I was looking at sort of what were the really sort of trendy areas that were going on. Convenience already was a very engaged area. Uh, I like to use the word breakfastization. We already were coming in, into our homes and having dinners where I, you know, I would have a frozen this and my wife would have a frozen that and the kids wanted to have their mac and cheese. It was all very convenient because Stouffer's or President's Choice gave us those options. There was a little bit of emerging health uh, uh, at that stage. <laughs> health really meant lean cuisine and it was under 300 calories. And there was a little bit of an emerging green uh, 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 environmental focus, and we'd launched PC Green back in two th uh, two, uh, 1989. But we then very quickly faced the early 90s. Uh, the environment uh, went for a ball of chalk, and suddenly green disappeared. So it really had no, it had no, it had no legs. And you would see the odd green bag that someone had sort of put away in their closet and would bring it up. But anyway things suddenly then started to change. And I love this quote. Um, and this goes back to 1993. This is David Glass. He was the president of Loblaws, in those days, at least of, of Walmart. Walmart weren't in Canada by that stage, by the way. But he said, by the end of this decade, more than half of the total retailers will be out of business. That was, that was a US quote, but it applied globally. And it certainly applied here. And we can look at that batting list that in fact, if you're a young kid today, half of those, uh, those businesses mean nothing to you uh, other than maybe more recently the whole uh, target coming and going very quickly in, in this market. But today we deal with a very, very different dynamic. We've obviously got you know, organizations like Costco, Walmart, ethnic is exploding, e-commerce, and I don't think we've even scratched the surface of where e-commerce is going. Loblos has started in Toronto, uh, a, 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 a click and collect uh, a, a situation where you can go on, buy all, all, you know, whatever you want within the entire stable, you pull up your car and you just load it into your car. If you're in the UK, where obviously the geography is different, uh, you know, all the major retailers are, are, have home deliveries. Um, my daughter, who used to work for Loblaws, has just joined an organization called Well.ca in Toronto, and it's all about being online. And I think it's a very exciting opportunity, because as we heard earlier, this is where the, uh, the market is going. We do face one of the most discount-orientated markets in the world, probably after Germany. Uh, 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 the Canadians are focused on, on, on discount. And I'm gonna touch a little bit about that a little bit um, uh, later. But what is interesting is we've got this dichotomy of discount. We want to pay nothing for our everyday products, but when we get into lifestyle needs and, and, and issues, and again, we heard about this later, we are prepared to pay a premium. But the lines have been completely blurred. 
Where we used to go traditionally to do our shopping no longer exists. You can go into a, a, a warehouse, you can go into a, a superstore, you can go into your local shopper's drug mart, and you can do your weekly shopping almost to a degree. And the one area I haven't touched on this and will come is what I call the gas bar or the gas forecourt business, and it will be increasingly play a dominant role where you pull in, fill in your gas, and buy very, very specialty goods. You won't be just going in for your bag of Frito-Lays or your, your rather old stale uh, uh, cakes and things like that. You will, in the future, be going in and buying very, very specialized fresh products as well. But what has also happened is the consolidation. And I don't know if anybody around this room knows, since Loblaw bought shoppers a year ago, they are Canada's biggest company in, from a, a sales point of view today. They employ the most and certainly were well on their way during those days, but they are now Canada's biggest company. It's an over $45 billion business. And they, they you know, as I say, they, I think they, with shoppers now, they've got about 150 or 160,000 employees. I mean, it is, this is, this is a monster. But they also have the number one consumer brand in Canada today, which is President's Choice, and the number two consumer brand, which is no name, number three is craft, and number seven is life. And they haven't really even started yet with life because you're gonna start seeing life appear in both, or both organizations as well. So my prediction is the life brand will be up there in three and four in the, in the not too distant future. And the, the grocery aisle no longer dominates. We've moved as consumers increasingly towards the periphery, but we are still in Canada a wash with SX footage, which means that we it in conti continually drives this competitiveness that we're involved, uh, that we're that we face. But preparing for the storms, no one, no, you couldn't have predicted the specific storm. But our research teaches you can predict the certainty there will be a storm, and that's what we are currently facing in retail in Canada. We know we're going to face the storms, and where are they going to come from? So when the retailers start to look at what this is all about, I have one word for you on this, in this room. And if you walk, around, walk away with anything else other than looking for the future, it's one word. It's risk management, or maybe that's two words. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, ultimately, when you start to look at the enormous uh, 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 areas, it's a big web of issues. They're obviously, in, in, and when I, one of the things Rick didn't touch on, in my last four years at Loblaws, I was, I was in charge of their sustainability initiative, and I was implementing their sustainable seafood initiative, which globally has been recognized as one of probably the most engaging and an all-encompassing seafood initiatives anywhere in the world. But what was interesting was where the investors were looking to see where a company like Loblaws was, and what were the Achilles heels, and what was actually going to drive the business. And whether it's food safety and traceability, and I'm going to touch on a lot of those, but this gives you a little bit of a sense. But what I do want to touch on, because I'm not going to come to it right until, uh, really until the end, and again, it was touched on on a previous uh, uh, slide, is this question about the whole, uh, the whole question of it's no longer a one-up, one-down relationship when you're in the food business. It's a, a, it's a myriad of relationships and it's stakeholder engagement, and what I call the four-legged stool. You've got the retailers or the market forces, you've got the manufacturers and the food supply chain, and they are one continuum that the retailers see. The retailers also then look to government and academia to be part of the solution and the engagement. And then finally, another incredibly important part of the discussions that are taking place or what are the roles of NGOs and other marketing forces. So in the past where you just said, I'm gonna do it and get on with it, unless you are engaged in all those four areas, that in fact no longer is, you know, is, is a viable uh, 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 situation. Again, and I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly because A, I think they're looking for a little bit of time to catch up. But this is, a, this is actually, I'm sorry, have I lost a slide? Go back. Okay, there. Um, this is interesting. This is, uh, I've got to acknowledge, this is a Loblaw piece of research. So it's only customers that are actually shopping at Loblaws, but they may shop elsewhere. They may, might be in uh, Overweighty. They might be in a Walmart, but it was called two shoppers. It's a 1,000 consumers. 
So it's a fairly rigorous piece of research when you get to 1,000 consumers. And they were asked what were the areas that they could, uh, from a, a CSR point of view, that really mattered most. Now, there was, a, there was a drop down, it was a batting list, they were predetermined. But what was interesting is 40% of consumers talked about local sourcing. We could talk the whole day about what is local sourcing. For me, on one hand, local sourcing could be made in Canada. You know, I could be in Ontario and I could actually have Okanagan apples or peaches or whatever. That's still local sourcing to a degree. But it's interesting to see that this is in fact, in, that the consumers are being engaged in an area where they weren't before. 44% are health choices. Well, that doesn't come as a surprise. I've lost my screen bound down, by the way, over here. And I know it's gonna tell me that, okay, thanks. That's gonna tell me how much time I've got sometime along the line. Um, but also, I do want to, and you can't see the, uh, the fine print, but even the lower, in the lower areas of 25, 25 to 29 percent uh, uh, and below, there are issues here that weren't even vaguely on our radar three, five uh, years ago. So we are, and we'll come back in five years, and I can tell you right now, we'll pull up the screen, and a lot of what are those low little areas of don't really have to worry about it, they'll be right up there as well. Another viewpoint that retailers have is how they are now looking at the complete, uh, 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 complete product life cycle. It's absolutely fundamental to understand that you're looking at sourcing, you're looking at production, you're looking at packaging, you're looking at transportation, you're looking at retailing, and what is absolutely crucial, sorry I've gone too far, is that you are looking at what is actually happening, I've gone too far, is what is happening in the home. Because the, even in every one of those spheres, as a retailer, if you're not thinking about those issues, you're not finding a solution to how you're actually gonna compete. Now why I say that is, in fact, obviously we've talked about local sourcing, starting at sourcing, but the whole question, if you go the full gambit, retailers are very concerned about this whole issue around waste whether it's waste in their own stores or the waste that they're actually creating at home, and that's where the majority of waste is actually taking place. We know that, that they know that they are part of, 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 of finding a, res a resolution because ex the consumers are expecting it. So I showed you some earlier slides about when I first arrived in Canada about how I used to look at innovation. Today, it's a very different kettle of fish again. It's all about well-being, it's all about ecological efficiencies, and it's all about the marketing forces. A lot of very similar uh, things are appearing, but you're looking them in a very different light. And one of the things that I want to talk about here, and I'm going to go through this in a little bit more detail, but on well-being is the whole question of social. I'm not gonna go into it much more difficulty, uh, in much more detail, but I wanna give you a heads up that this is something that we no longer can ignore. When I, in fact, it was interesting during my days within sustainable seafood, and there were two programs evolving. There was the Marine Stewardship Council program, which was all about wild harvested seafood, and the other one was the emerging aquaculture standards. And I couldn't understand why the aquaculture standards were implying that there had to be very rigid social implications around how you were sourcing your fish and where it was being farmed and whether the farmers were being paid a, 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 an acceptable wage or whether they were unionized. And I, you know, to me, it was all about saving the fish. It wasn't saving about the human, uh, the human, the human uh, nation. But in fact, ultimately, that is where things have gone. And, if, and, and, and quite frankly, you'll all be very, very uh, aware recently that it happened uh, uh, two years ago, that Loblaws and a lot of other retailers faced the catastrophe that, ha that happened in Bangladesh when in Rana the, 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 the manufacturing unit collapsed and killed thousands of people. That should never have happened, unfortunately it did. But in, as we move forward, increasingly those people who are in the market have to and will be engaged about what is happening in the factories around the world. There's also been, from a seafood point of view, there's been a lot of press recently, and in fact even today, about what is actually happening in Thailand, about the fact that there are actually Cambodians and Bangladeshis that are actually being almost trapped into a slave labor type of industry that are actually used by the fishermen who are going out so they can pay for nothing for their labor. And, and these, things, uh, these, these things eventually, the chickens come home to roost eventually as these, uh, these issues have arrived. So I'm not gonna go into much more detail, um, but just to give you a sense that, the, the, that uh, yeah, this is a point of discussion. 
So when you're at Loblaws, and, and ultimately the organization is sitting down and planning, and where they're looking about the future vision of principles, this currently is the five uh, uh, blocks uh, that they are currently looking at. It's obviously for them, and I'll come back to the risk management, it's all about the lightning rods. There's, there's far too much for them to cover, and they don't expect to actually try and engage in all areas. But certainly there are, as we'll go through, and I'll go into a little bit more details, this is all about connecting with consumers, about lifestyles and values. And we've heard this repeatedly, and I think if we just, if we, if we scratch the surface now, it's increasingly going to be uh, 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 an important issue. I talk about the Whole Foods versus the Walmart, uh, Walmart factor. And, I, I, and I, I talked about a little bit earlier about us being very discount orientated versus very we're prepared to pay for our lifestyle issues. These are the areas where we're prepared to pay for our lifestyle issues and the consumers are prepared unequivocally to pay some form of premium if they're going to meet those, the, 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 that sort of expectation. So I come back to those three pillars that I had previously, and I'm the, the first pillar was well-being. And uh, yeah, I've, 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 I, yeah I've, I've, I've talked a little bit about the social aspect, but there is one aspect about well, well-being that we touched that I had at the top of it, it's around food safety. And we've known, we've lived in Canada enough to see what has happened with, with, with Maple Leaf and how they man had to manage the whole issue around uh, uh, Listeria. And quite frankly, when you've got a brand like Loblaws has with President's Choice, which is a $4 billion brand, it can be brought down to its knees if the food safety issue actually uh, 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 hit the fan. It is probably the most critical uh, issue that one has to, uh, to manage uh, moving forward. Secondly, health and well, uh, wellness. And, 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 and one of my areas of, of, of responsibility was launching this Blue Menu program, which I'm, uh, I was very pleased to, 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 to be part of. There had been previously a rather mishmash of program called Too Good To Be True. Uh, it really just didn't connect with consumer. It was a very interesting case study about how not to do something, although the products were wonderful. But in fact, I was given the opportunity to come back and to relaunch it, and we came out with, came out with the Blue Menu program. But Blue Menu was really, there were a number of different factors that were the key success about Blue Menu. But for me, the one most important p piece about its success uh, other than by pure chance, we came up with a great looking label that you could walk through the stores and you could actually, and there's been a Harvard case study around it and it was just totally by coincidence, by the way. We, just, we decided that was the label we were going for and off we went. But it was keeping it simple. Blue Menu had many different attributes and there were very key, key criteria. The calories couldn't be above a certain level and fat levels couldn't be above certain levels. But it was always the primary message was the key message you put on the back page what else attributes were, and you then got the consumer who in a nanosecond, and if I can, I can re-emphasize, when you're in a competitive environment, you've got a nanosecond to communicate with that consumer, keep it simple, and that was a great, great opportunity to, to get into. So we, we've, we've also heard about natural food products, and of course, certainly in Canada, we have, of course, more rigorous uh, 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 regulatory, uh, regulatory uh, restraints about the word natural, but increasingly the consumers are moving towards, and, 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 and it certainly was covered in, in more than enough detail in the, in, in the previous uh, 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 or two presentations, so I'm not even gonna go there. But really the consumers are wanting to know that you're taking the stuff out of the foods. And they just, they expect it. So you've got a range of, pro uh, like Loblaws with their President's Choice lineup, the expectation is there are no artificial colors, there are no artificial uh, uh, flavors. Um, what has, and I say this has become a bit of a double-edged sword, is as we've engaged with the consumers, we've actually asked them to ask the question. We, we've actually, we expect consumers now to ask the questions. So in fact, ultimately, you know, they are now asking questions around areas like GMOs, for example, that are very complicated and for the market themselves to have a tough time really coming up with what is the way to actually move forward. I also, as was mentioned earlier, I was responsible for in, involved for launching organics. What was interesting around the organic program, it was very successful, but not in meat. And, and as a result, we, we came up 
with uh, the, the opportunity uh, to launch what was in this terminology, and you hear the word free from used for various different terminologies, but in Loblaw's meat program, free from is an expectation of no antibiotics or no hormones. It has been an incredible success. And again, I come back to this whole question of having the ability to touch on the emotive side of, of connecting with consumers, and if you can, and, and, and we know young mothers are very concerned about the whole question about what they're giving their kids, Increasingly, of course, from an anti antibiotic point of view, there's concerns in the broader medical environment that we're just being exposed to too many antibiotics. But this certainly has become a huge success. When I left Loblaws, one of the things I thought before, before, as I walked out the door was I was very relieved I was leaving animal welfare behind. Um, the, uh, a bit like GMOs, you can, you, whatever the science is, you can't necessarily have the answers for the consumers. But this is, again, another area of enormous interest from a consumer point of view. Science versus ideology happens and is going to continue to happen. And you can have the best scientists in the world, and you can be doing things for the best reasons, but not necessarily you are going to have the right answers. And I'm telling you that right now, that as strong as I believe in science, and science has to be the backbone for whatever we do, there are times when it is just going to be a tough sell. And unfortunately, this is an, and, 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 and uh, the person who took over my role at Loblaws, Melanie Agopian, uh, she coined since in the case of science cannot be our compass, we need to develop our own ethical standards and practice to navigate animal welfare issues. I think the critical issue here in, uh, in, in animal welfare issues, there has to be basic standards, there have to be consistent basic standards, and organizations need to have scientific advice uh, behind them as well. So don't fly by the seat of your pants and think that you can have a bunch of PR guys that are going to do the work for you. As we move forward also, we know that we increasingly are seeing the desire for alternatives. We've talked about the whole question of protein. We obviously have uh, uh, consumers who are looking for alternatives. Here, Paul McCartney, uh, and this goes back to his, his, uh, his earlier wife, Linda, had come out with a range of products uh, and become enormously successful in Europe and Britain. And I think we're, we're, we're clearly we're seeing that question of choice that in, uh, is the case. I, myself, I love my, my meat, I love my fish but I'm very happy a couple of times a week to be having a vegetarian uh, a, a diet because I just know that in terms of the, the, the full-blown implications, it's important. I then come on to the ecological efficiencies. And what is absolutely fascinating, and again uh, it has been enormous successes I touched on, has been this ability to come out with this Free From lineup. But to me, when I launched Free From, I didn't just see it as connecting to the consumers around some emotive issues. I saw it with the ability for Loblaws at the retailer at the one end of the spectrum to actually get to the farm gate at the other end of the spectrum. So we actually worked with a feed company who actually introduced us to a stable of, 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 of producers, whether they were beef, whether they were pork, or whether they were poultry. And I saw the opportunity that this would be work with those, those, cons th those, those producers, work with them that they knew they had a guaranteed supply and it would come at a premium. I won't go into the fact that it probably was not enough of a premium because we were a supermarket that we should have paid, but we were paying a premium. But what was critical about it was the ability to then work with them on other issues. And whether I was in discussions with them around animal welfare, the ability to take and trace back to that farm gate where the product came from. And that has been the huge success. We could take a photograph of the farmer, put it on the package, and you have that ability to connect with the farm gate, and it's all about when you're trying to deal with risk, you've got to deal with some form of trust. And this was the area that we could actually, we could, we could work around. And it's been a phenomenal success. But there are other a areas around uh, what we're talking about from, fr uh, from, a, from a local point of view or the ability to, 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 to deal directly with the farm gate. And the farm gate doesn't necessarily have to be out in the country. It doesn't have to be rural anymore. The farm gate increasingly may well be in our backyard. It could be in the space behind our warehouse, for example, where you could have high-intensity grow-ups. And no, I'm not talking about legalizing the mar marijuana 
but we will increasingly grow produce in our backyards. Can you imagine schlepping produce out of a very embattled area like California at the moment, half or three quarters away, right across the country, to try and sell in, a, in, in, in Nova Scotia, for example? What is it like when it gets there? These are uh, increasingly going to be the solutions that you can tap into energy resources and that the fact you can have stuff that is grown and in the stores the next day. I'm also a great believer in the future of, 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 of closed containment fish farming. You can pro bring protein, millions of fish in a relatively small uh, piece of space that you can actually you, you, you can have right on your doorstep. Yeah, there are challenges. We do certainly need to, to resolve issues around energy and, and other things, but they will come, and this is what the future will look like. Retail is also looking at, obviously, and I'm not going to go into this area because this is not my, 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 my area of expertise, but obviously how do they, they address areas of our common emissions? And they're not just thinking about their own trucks, by the way. They're thinking about how to take that source right back to the farm gate and what can they do. And uh, a water stewardship, and this is an area that I do believe very strongly. We have a rather mis misguided idea here that in Canada this is not an issue, but it is an enormous issue. We even hear in your part of the world, the South Saskatchewan River starts to run dry in summer. So it's not even that we have all the water in the world, but we import a lot of products. And again, I touched on California recently, or whether we're growing co uh, cotton in Bangla Bangladesh. Our lifestyles are clearly going to be dictated around how we manage this whole issue around water stewardship in the 21st century. And there are various different areas. We can get engaged with beef, and I'm not proposing, being in Alberta, that we stop eating any, any less beef, otherwise I won't get out of here alive. But I do believe we have to do things smarter, and we have to do things more, more carefully. And what I do think you will get out of this increasingly, because it's a very tough message to get to the consumers, and when you're trying to make these initiatives happen, one is you can get to the consumers and you can get them locked and loaded, and in other areas, you can't. Funny enough, the sustainable seafood initiative that I was involved in, we were singly unsuccessful in getting through to the consumer. Yeah, we did a little bit in BC, and yeah, we did a little bit in Nova Scotia. But really, the consumers, they just, you know, they looked out at the seas, they saw the beautiful seas, what was happening below them was out of, out of sight, out of mind. However, the critical issue about those, that sustainable seafood initiative was it became a business to business initiative. It became the specifications around which you, bu you buy products. And I think the solution around water stewardship may well be business to business, where are you doing, where, how are your products, where they're being, uh, how, they, how they're being managed, and what is supporting that sourcing in terms of managing issues around uh, uh, water supplies. So you've got lob laws involved again, and these are recent initiatives. They actually are uh, the, 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 the farm, the, far, the, sea, the, 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 the farm's uh, seafood one was in my day. They've, they've gone on to get involved with the round table for sustainable crops, the round table for sustainable beef. They know that unless they're getting together with other market leading organizations, whether it's McDonald's, whoever, and are working towards coming up with standards and policies and positions, they really are not going to get anywhere. This is collective. This is where I come back to this four-legged stu stool that you no longer can just work in isolation. Sure, Loblaws might be twice the size of any other retailer in Canada, but unless you bring all the other stakeholders to the table, you are simply not just going to get anywhere. So certainly, and we, this is a lovely sort of fuzzy Coca-Cola, which I always find a little bit of a challenge given the fact that Coca-Cola is there to preserve our, our polar bears on the one hand, but give us all the sugar that we need on the other. Uh, that's a rather cynical look of things. But having said that, they've learned that there is a very clear way of, of engaging their consumers by showing a much more sustainable uh, front. And, and, and Loblaws and their initiative I've touched on, and I'm not going to go on, is the whole focus around their sustainable seafood. We also have touched on the question around the, qu the question of, of waste. And I don't think we can ignore at our level, whether it's you as the manufacturers, retailers, the fact that we are part of the solution. We know that we're going to talk about feeding, the, we're talking about the feeding the nine billion. This may well be part of the solution. It's not exclusively, 
But when you hear of statistics of 30 or 40, or in seafood, 50% of the products being wasted from the time they're being har harvested to the time the consumer throws the stuff away, can you imagine if we could get better control over that and we'll never, it will never disappear altogether because that's you know, one's in cloud cuckoo land. But if we could get, the, get, get a better focus on coming up with solutions in this area, and quite frankly, I think the retailers have a huge responsibility because it's happening a lot in, in, in our homes. And I, my own view is I think that there are many different ways the retailers can play. I mean, it's a double-edged sword for them. They get a handle on selling less waste to the consumers you know, you, they're going to reduce their, their overnight tonnage by an, an enormous amount of, of, of product as well. But I think there's a huge amount of advantage. And I think, you know, you've got someone like Galen who knows that and is, is focused on it. And then finally, and I'm just, how's my time? Um, I haven't seen any, any, any times coming up. Maybe I've missed them over there. Um, but I am getting towards the end. Market forces. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I t I've touched upon this whole question of knowing when your food comes from and trust and 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 being able to 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 trust where you know, that that you're making the claim, and this is an area that I think is going to explode in the food in the food supply chain. The governments are slowly; they have to. They just don't have the resource. They don't have the money to be engaged. I certainly, hopefully, CFIA and Health Canada will continue to be as vigilant as possible from a food safety point of view. But they're going to back out of other areas, and it's going to be incumbent on us in the market to have reputable areas of self-regulation. And I think this is an area that we we, we really haven't given uh, an, enough thought to. And it's, and it's going to be part and parcel of the way we do business. As our natural capital becomes increasingly under pressure, whether it's seafoods or forests or, or palm oil, and you make a claim that this is actually, you, you've got a responsible source, you need to have something to back it up. Uh, and of course, there's this whole question around fraud, and we know that, and, 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 and I'm working with the guys at the University of Guelph, where there's some really groundbreaking and very economical ways of now monitoring products from, from a DNA point of view. Rick introduced me to the guys there, and it's very exciting. The other area that has just for us from a Canadian perspective, have, has just, and, and I love, I'm, I'm a foodie. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely unequivocally a foodie. I'm passionate about traveling the world, going into different markets. If you come and look at my Blackberry, if you're in Morocco, I'll tell you to go here, or if you're in South Africa, to go there. But I love what is happening from an ethnic point of view and the diversity that's happening in our own markets. But items that we took as being very specialized in the past are now just becoming the way we do day-to-day -day businesses. And this is an area I cannot is stress enough that if you aren't in and don't have an open view about what's happening in the ethnic market, you're going to get left behind. We've talked enough about the movement to the periphery of the store. The consumer is foregoing the, the grocery uh, aisles, and they want to find whether it's prepared, and we've talked about the convenience, and whether it's the ability to do stuff from scratch, or whether you're a weekend warrior. They're all about the, uh, yeah, these are all factors that actually tie in then to the whole question of convenience. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think it was covered uh, more than adequately previously. Uh, I've touched upon the nine billion. I think we know that this is that this is a very crucial piece because our global food supply, I, I, our, our food supply is so global. We import forty-one billion dollars worth of food into Canada every year. Can you, you know, we are competing with everyone else who's trying to, whether it's the emerging, emerging middle class in China or in India or in Brazil, this is what we're up against. I, this is a slide that I think might have come from Rick, I don't know, but in fact, ultimately, or was it Evan Fraser? But in fact, where the, 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 ex the exploding protein beef industry is, is taking place. In some ways, I think it's fantastic. I think being a livestock producer in, in Canada, whether you're going to face the challenges of, of animal welfare or not, but I think the opportunities are fantastic, uh, but they certainly are part of it. However, this one discussion continues to keep on going on of when are we going to, you know, where are the prices of food going to go? Quite frankly, my own view is there is always going to be pressure on the food supply chain. I talked about the Walmart versus whole, whole food factor. We have got to the point, we, we spend less than 10% of our income on food, which is a challenge because we don't give it the respect we need to give it. And quite frankly, that goes through to a lot of the, the issues that we face. 
but in fact, ultimately, you know, you, you, we expect to pay nothing for the products that we, we use every day. Yes, we, will, we have lifestyle choices, and yes, we're prepared to pay, pay a little bit more. But what happens when free from becomes every day? And you're paying a 15% premium at the moment for no antibiotics for months? Five years' time, I'll tell you, you'll expect to pay the same price that you pay for your normal meat products. So those products become every day, and they will face the challenges. And one of the challenges about that is, of course, is that you've got this enormous challenge between organizations, whether they're manufacturers trying to dominate the market, or whether they're retailers trying to dominate the market, or who plays off what. But certainly, they are part of that. So with that, thank you very much. And I don't know how my time is. I think I'm actually right on, and I need to move over the table.